Now, when security vendors like like us, like Dre and I are talking to you right now, a lot of times they want to tell you about how we caught Russia and how we caught China. Um, but uh, this is not one of those stories because we want to talk about something that's very prevalent, that's very meaningful. Um, this is something we see when we talk about shadow IT. And just to define that for some of you, again, not judging or anything, but this is IT that maybe the IT administration um, of your organization is not aware of. So these are things that users bring on their own, whether that's hardware or software, things that they download and install. On their own. Um, and so I'm going to start passing this over to Dre, but I want to highlight that this is something that is very prevalent and might be, you know, prevalent in your environment right now. So we'll actually have some links on this uh, later on as we go. So Dre, do you want to talk about QuickBooks with us? Yeah, man. So I'll start by saying that ThreatOps uh, differentiates EDR. We take ownership of detecting, containing, and contextualizing threat signals. Uh, the reason I call them threat signals is because our job is to work out, is this a false positive and a true positive? We don't want to wake you up at two in the morning with a high severity that ends up not being fine. And so for some things like Mimi Cats, when you see a threat signal, it's probably not going to be good. You barely need the human. That just goes without saying. But there are other instances where having threat ops driving the EDR makes sense, right? When there are more vaguer alerts, when there are more contextual threat signals. And that's where I think we show our value. So QuickBooks is a wonderful one. So since, uh, when did I pull the data? January 1st to March 24th, we've sent 100 and, well, there's been 119 threat signals for malicious QuickBooks. What do we mean there? So QuickBooks is accounting software, if you're not 100% familiar with it. Uh, but sometimes people don't just go, I want to buy QuickBooks to their finance person or their IT person. No, sometimes they just take it upon themselves to go and find QuickBooks out in the world. And what's really interesting is you can find QuickBooks right now. It'll work to some extent, but it's actually backdoored. It's actually malware. It's not trying to help you do accountancy software. It's, it's, it's trying to ruin your day. And so since January, we've told 119 different folk like, hey, you, you think you downloaded QuickBooks. It's behaving like QuickBooks, but it is not in fact QuickBooks. So that to me is one of the benefits of, of ThreatUps, but I wanted to tease apart a little bit, Tofa, like how we do what we do. And hopefully by the end of it, everybody's going to be very paranoid and they're going to go and check for QuickBooks in their environment. So if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. So a QuickBooks report. In fact, Tofa, would you mind talking about this one? Sure. So this is kind of mirroring that uh, report that I showed earlier. But basically, as I said, uh, anytime you get an incident from us, it's going to be something that is more than likely malicious and is actionable and needs your attention right away. And so this is a report uh, specifically for QuickBooks. We've obviously redacted some of it because we don't want to share partner information or current partner information. And as I stated before, it's going to give you um, sort of an overview as far as like what the risk associated with the threat is, uh, where we found it, and additional information. So for this specific one, because it's so easy to, you know, like misunderstand, like my security provider is telling me that QuickBooks, which is a legitimate program, is is not right you know it's telling me that it's a it's malicious what's going on in this one we actually have the link to our support article here um in the ticket just kind of an example of how these reports are are all inclusive also want to mention i didn't mention it before my fault um that these reports are crafted by the analysts they're not automated as well so they're reviewed and crafted by the analysts before they go out to add this type of amplifying information um in fact if you're interested and in, we can drop that in the chat as well um Alexis, if you've got a moment. Um, that support article on QuickBooks will also give some context on what we're talking about today. And you don't have to be a current partner to look at that support article. In fact, feel free to browse around. Um, but back to you, Dre. Thanks, Tofa. If you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. So how do we determine uh, the one after that as well, please? Oh, did you want to talk about remediations? Or do you... Sure. We should do that. Um, <laughs> Nothing like live TV. Anyway, um, so as I mentioned too, uh, remediations will be pulled out for you. So you'll get them in the report. You can also see them pulled out kind of in this, uh, this view here. Um, but in the vast majority of time, you'll have the ability to do the automated remediations as well. So these are just kind of screenshots of what you would see in the dash. And I think that's what we're really trying to highlight here is we want to show you what the product looks like as well. Thanks, Topher. Next slide, please, dude. So cool. So how does ThreatOps determine that this particular QuickBooks malware isn't legit? So the first is the idea of global prevalence. Go global prevalence is great for companies like Huntress. 
we have a butt ton of telemetry. I think that's a technical term. Uh, our global reach is pretty good. And so what we can do is very quickly ascertain, well, what's normal? If QuickBooks legitimately installs in particular places, if it calls its files particular things, and if it just does particular stuff, well, then we're going to see that on scale. Therefore, when things stand out, we know it really quickly. And so in the screenshot, what I've done there is I've queried and just said, hey, QuickBooks, uh, in our, through our EDR telemetry, and it's come back and it's been like, hey, here's what we think QuickBooks should look like. But you'll see that there's a couple of things underlined, and it's clearly saying this isn't good. Right. So that's it's just a really easy way that we start off with our investigation. We really quickly contextualize. Well, what do we know to be globally prevalent, therefore normal? And then what is already standing out? And by the way, just because something stands out doesn't make it bad. Right. People install things in a strange place. That's what threat ops is there to do. But we've got some other tricks as well to try to work out. If you want to go into the next slide, Tofa. I will, and I will say that I'm super glad that I'm driving the slides this time because now I I, I can hold you hostage and ask you questions. <laughs> Instead of me being a whirlwind. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry, dude. <laughs> right, so can you briefly talk about, uh, because that's something we talk about here a lot at Huntress, is the fact that we have all this telemetry and we have all this internal uh, cyber threat intelligence, right, or CTI, and we also use those external sources. And can you talk about the difference of having a dedicated team for doing that as oh, opposed to trying to be uh, like on a small yeah. team or an internal team trying to pull all these intelligence sources and, and trying to figure out what's malicious and what's not malicious? Yep. So I've, I've worked for a couple of security companies now, and typically you have to do every role, right? It's you are the detection engineer, the SIEM engineer, the SOC, the uh, instruments, but you're everything. Working at Huntress is refreshing because we've got a conveyor belt of folk, right? And along this conveyor belt, as you go along, everybody's got their team functions. So we've got our detection engineering team made up of some really cool people who are there testing to make sure what's the precision like for this? What's the true positive to false positive, right? We've got intelligence folks who are looking out on the interwebs for different QuickBooks malware, for example, and being like, okay, well, how up to date are our detections? are we still as good as we were a month ago when it came to this particular thing? And we iterate over that again and again. It means that I can just do my job. My team can just do their job. They're not having to worry about the efficacy of the data they're getting. By doing that, we can then just give quicker answers to our partners. So there's a really nice filtration that we've got at Huntress where we're not worrying about the complexity because that's someone else's job. And by the way, when you do that, you break a complex thing down to the point that it is no longer complex. Awesome. Thank you, Dre. I, I promise to not keep you hostage too much longer. <laughs> we've, only, most... we've only got about eight minutes, so <laughs> there you go. Right. So the other way that Threat Ops determines this, and I quite like this one because it's my level of, of intelligence, uh, it's typos, right? So uh, you have to remember that threat actors are busy people. They've, they've got other crimes to commit. So they're not going to overthink about how they're spelling. Sometimes they also can't spell it the legitimate way. Um, because maybe that file already exists. There's, there's lots of reasons why they do what they do. But what's really interesting is if you create a detector that specifically looks for um, characters that are, so uh, words that are misspelled, or characters that don't belong together. So there's a great, great sans, uh, not sans, uh, there's a great Python script called, I think it's like deep blue CLI, or no, it's freak, uh, freak.py. And it looks at what are the chances that two letters will be squished together, right? So in the English lexicon, how many words can be combined? And then it does that. Well, we kind of do a similar thing, but it doesn't even need to be that complex. What's the opposite of like machine learning, dumb human, right? So you just go, well, I know how this should be spelled. So why don't you show me every variation? So what you've got on the top of the screen there is you've got the Hunter CDR dashboard with a bright red icon saying, hey, something isn't making sense about this supposed QuickBooks install. And so what I did is I, I pulled it out, put it in the command line to just highlight that it's spelling the word downloader incorrectly. And the legitimate one will, funnily enough, spell it correctly. And the malicious one calls it downloader. What's really interesting about that is when you put that to most folk, they can't differentiate. And it's not because they're not, you know, it's not, they're not stupid. It's just how our brains work. Our brains aren't reading every single letter and every single word. That's on purpose, right? These threat actors are doing these kind of things on purpose. So it will slip under the radar. And by the way, a lot of the times when we send reports, the reasons that they're rejected is because somebody says, no, no, this is supposed to be here. And we're like, downloader? Really? <laughs> and then they usually see what we're saying. And you can verify for us that that's just not a UK spelling. Correct. That is not a UK spelling. That is just what we call wrong. Right. Excellent. Yeah.
<laughs> That's the legal definition. But we've got more. We've got other ways. So this is a really interesting one. So what you're looking at now is the Huntress EDR uh, zoning, zoning in, zoning in. There we go, zeroing in uh, on a particular executable. And so this particular is a QuickBooks ex executable. But I want you to pay attention to the way that we've pulled out the certificate. That is signed from a gentleman from Sri Lanka. I am here to tell you that QuickBooks does not sign their executables with that particular certificate. And so in the Huntress support article that we often send to folk who reject our reports, we say, hey, do me a favor, um, go and check the certificate for this executable because we know it to be malicious, but we just want you to see. And that's when people go, oh, and we can do this at scale, right? We're really good at figuring out what's being maliciously signed, when are certs um, being used for things that shouldn't be? So drivers are a great example of that, right? Where we work out, mm, I don't think that should be doing that. And we do all of that for um, at scale because we're so busy clearing out the false positives. We don't send false positives. We don't work on false positives. Once we know something's a false positive, we suppress it out so we don't have to see it again. That lets us do things like this really well. Excellent. And so uh, just a quick point here on that because this isn't like part of a core EDR feature, right? So like, can you talk about what kind of insight you would have into a system in, in the oh, process yeah, of an investigation, right? This was yeah. this isn't something that would just pop up in, in, the, in the dash automatically for our guys. Yeah, so again, as an EDR, you want to be able to have visibility from almost a single pane of glass, but you also need to be able to get down and dirty with the data, right? So most of our threat ops analysts want to be able to look at more. Right? They need to be able to look at more. And so we're able to make particular requests through the EDR, particular tasks. Now, these tasks are very curated, so no one can just run code on your endpoints. They're particular tasks that, generally speaking, will allow us to uh, dir list and then collect files. What we're doing there is we're trying to work out, okay, well, where did this malware come from? Can we reverse it? Uh, we can't just do that by seeing a process on an EDR, right? And this is why EDR isn't, you know, the point of a managed EDR is someone's going to go beyond. Someone's going to look beyond the first layer of technology. Whereas if you've only got somebody that can say, hey, something bad, we're not too sure, good luck. Uh, that, that's a lot of folk in the industry. I've, I've worked for those kind of places. It's very unsatisfying as a security analyst. But we can collect a button. We can look at a lot. Uh, we are trained digital forensic investigators. Right? We've got people here that wrote the book, like Jamie Levy, Harlan Carvey, uh, I myself am a former incident responder. So like we we we've not we're not staffed by level one SOC analysts. And if we were, that wouldn't be a problem. But we've got some seriously lethal ninjas on the team. Yeah, that's definitely my one of the biggest reasons that drew me here was was the people that we have working for Antrims. Cool. And then so Topa, there'll be some animations on here and I'll, I'll give you the heads up. So something that I love about this QuickBook story is it's very Huntress, like it's very Huntress bread and butter, right? So we've shown you EDR, but we're also showing you Huntress's initial offering, which is persistence, right? So QuickBooks, everything uses persistence, legitimate or not. It's just the way that a machine understands when to boot something up at particular times. But what you can do again at scale is work out, well, how does legitimate persistent, uh, legitimate QuickBooks persistence work? And so what we can do at scale, again, is work out, okay, well, what are the places QuickBooks is supposed to be? So in this first screenshot, you're seeing it's in the Windows startup. If you go into the next one, Tofa, it should be the uh, registry run key. So that is for specific users when they start up at specific times. And then after that, it should be a scheduled task. Uh, that's just a recurring task that will bring up programs, right? But what you're noticing with all three of these is our, our telemetry is catching it, right? It's catching it. It's giving us great detail without us needing to go down too far into the data so that we can very quickly ascertain like, hey, this shouldn't be here. And by the way, our detectors are very, very good at being like, yeah, dude, this absolutely shouldn't be here or it should be here, but it should be called this thing. When we're wrong, when a detector has brought something up and it ends up being fine, we just press close. No need to worry about it. A senior person, a manager will go and look at that, hammer out the detection. But when it's illegitimate, that's when we issue a report. And when we issue a report for these kind of things, I love it because you can press one button and it goes away. And then, okay, submit your users for security training because they shouldn't have been downloaded. <laughs> but the point is there aren't many, there are lots of things that involve security intrusions where you can't just press a button and it goes away. There are lots of them. And I don't want to pretend that there are, that all I ever do is, is do that. However, there are some things 
that you can just press a button and it goes away and it's very satisfying and this is one of them and i'm very glad to be honest that we we're spending time talking about quickbooks versus super elite apts if you want to talk about that stuff find me on twitter i love to talk about it but this is the kind of stuff we're going to be dealing with more often than not in our security uh, in our security in our uh, it environments this is this is the bread and butter of security it's not going to be not what well, could be north korea but it's probably going to be some- <laughs> Right, right. Sony and, and uh, ransomware and all that good stuff. So just just defining APT for folks at home, advanced persistent threat. Those tend to be the top tier adversary actors, people that are like state sponsored, um, you know, sponsored by other countries and adversaries and that sort of thing are really highly advanced ransomware gangs and stuff like that. But to Dre's point, that's not necessarily, you know, what you see on a daily basis. People in that category tend to have very specific targets and very specific motivations. Although some of them are aligned with ransomware and general ransomware crime, but on a day-to-day basis, you're more likely to see, um, you know, these lower-level threats in your in your environments. And then, Tofa, would you mind talking us through what happens when partners? You, I mean, you already told us, man. When partners say, "Hey, your report is wrong," <laughs> we say, "No, we're not." <laughs> but we don't just say, "No, you're not," right? Because some security vendors will leave you high and dry, and they'll go, "Okay." Yeah. So. Um, Right. As Dre pointed out, a lot of security vendors, you reject an incident and they say, okay, not our problem anymore. Um, Whenever you reject an incident through Huntress, we ask for your contact information because a lot of times it's going to, we're, as I said, very proud on our false positive rate. It's extremely low. So a lot of times we're going to have some follow up maybe and some follow up discussions and we're going to, you know, go out of our way to make sure that you understand that this might be actually a malicious threat in your environment. Uh, and not actual QuickBooks. And, and there's other stories, uh, Screen Connect, um, that's something we talked about last week. It's a, it's a very popular tool for uh, remote access. And that's another tool that we see a lot. People are like, oh no, we use Screen Connect. And like, but not this Screen Connect. Like there's a big difference. Um, we already shared the kind of this article in the chat, but basically this is their support article. We'll send that along again to kind of explain the differentiation. Um, And, you know, just something that's an extra step that we do. We really want to make sure that our partners are educated, not just, you know, we're not just there to um, collect your money. We're there to raise the cybersecurity poverty level for everybody. 